I think we're kind of working towards perception because this is, of course, in changing perception. And so maybe before we kind of get into some of the ideas about um, how do we change perception, you know, get to the nuts and bolts, um, get into some of the ideas of what is perception. Because it's a psychological term, and then if you haven't had a big background in, you know, psychology or psychotherapy, it can be like, well, I've got an idea of it. It's a little foggy. But it's a little foggy. I want to be precise. I want to yeah, be precise. What, is what is perception? Question. And, and of course, I think. well, let's, let me just throw it out. What is, when people think about perception, what comes to mind? In the course, it's perceived as being the individual viewpoint, which is coming from supportive ego and uh, filtered through the emotional body and uh, generally disinformed by the attitude body and uh, fairly blurrily viewed through uh, the agenda body. So you're saying very distorted. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be. Yeah. It, it can be. be and can be trained to higher, maybe a higher witness. states of consciousness to true, true perception of the real world. So anybody else on perception, anybody want to take a stab at what, what it means to you? I couldn't word it like you did. No, I just say how I see things. So, yeah, basically. Perception involves reading meaning into, in the sense that the, the second level, the second lesson of the course, which is real basic, you know, because they all kind of build upon each other, is I have given everything I see all the meaning that it has for me. And like you were saying before, it, it does seem to be kind of this individual thing in the sense that two, two or three, four people can see an accident happen, and then they'll ask for eyewitness accounts, write down exactly what happened, and then they write them down, and then you know, there we go. We've got, well, this is what the first person saw. And the course is saying is that, you know, every time you're feeling upset in any way, be fear, anger, depression, boredom, or whatever, you're making a decision in the moment, and you're choosing that emotion based on your interpretation or your perception of what's happening, which makes perfect sense why people can have all those reactions, because they were simply, they're different filters, you know, and it's simply a decision. Now, when you start to carry this out, though, and you start to apply this in your life, you know, go through, whether it's frustration at work, or frustration with the IRS, or frustration with in-laws, or, you know, with the weather, or with floods, or with that, anything like that, you can see how how backward our perception is. Is everybody kind of following that part about perception? If we don't see anything the way it truly is. And the reaction is always not to the fact of it, but to my interpretation of it. Another reason why it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> the, the motto, that's like the, that's the group motto now. It can seem, to a lot of people, that it doesn't matter stuff can seem like, well, wait a minute, there, things do matter. Don't you care? Don't you care? Yeah. Don't you have any compassion? <laughs> and. You know, it's, it's a fine learning to, uh, it, it gets back to changing your perception. And then when your perception is healed, when you're in your right mind, so to speak, whatever your actions are, whether it's, you know, reaching out and, and what the world's eyes would look like and giving a helping hand or whatever, it, it's done with purity because the intention is you're not doing it out of guilt. I mean, you could go down to an inner city and feel so much guilt about what you're seeing with homelessness or whatever and just kind of empty your pockets, you know, out of, with the attention of guilt, like, these people are so much worse off than I am, you know, that, that I feel so bad that I'm going to just give away everything I've got in my pockets to help me feel better. And the Course is kind of saying, well, you know, it's not the act of giving money even, or the act of doing something that will relieve you of your guilt, but it's only by, by getting clear in your perception that you'll be free of guilt. So where does perception come from? Thought. That the early lessons of the Course are teaching us that, you know, like lessons five, six, and seven, I'm never upset for the reason I think. It's a, such a good lesson because the first reaction a lot of times when things happen is, I know why I'm upset. I'm upset because 
you know, we were just same reason anybody would be upset. Yeah, <laughs> because they did this. And mm -hmm. Wouldn't you act that way too if somebody did this to you? I see something that is not there. Yeah. That would be upsetting. <laughs> You ever think of like on a desert where you see a mirage and you're hot and thirsty and you go and you think it's an oasis and you get there and it's more sand. It's not there. <laughs> you know, that to me those early lessons of the course are so profound because I'm never upset for the reason I think I'm upset because I see something that's not there. I see only the past. So you what you're saying. If I'm constantly watching the past and I'm getting all upset it, and it's because, in the sense that, that the past is where the guilt seems to occur. The past is where the ego's, that's the ego's, like, domain, you know. Present is where the Holy Spirit lives. And the mind that just wants to keep calling on the past and believing in its reality, you know, and... and rehashing it. Rehashing it. Or, if you, you know, like with relationships, I've talked to addiction counselors, you know, and they'll talk to, to people and they'll say, there's these patterns that emerge. People will say, I keep, I married five times, and this same thing keeps happening over and over. I, I try to marry somebody else, and it's like I married and do this, but the same thing, I married five alcoholics. Or, or it, can be, it can be with jobs, too. I mean, you know, you, you get a job that you think, ah, I hate this job. I'm going to get out of this job. And then, I hate this job. <laughs> you know, it's like it can be the past just keeps repeating itself. So if we get into the dynamics that we were just talking about, about perception and thought, what the Course says is that that you have, whenever you're thinking about the past or the future, your mind is literally blank, you know, you're, because your mind is filled with these past thoughts, and it projects these thoughts out, and that's what the world is. The world is literally the past thoughts in our mind that are projected out into the world. And so it's no wonder we get upset with what we're with these, we're seeing with these eyes is because we're we're literally viewing a script or we're viewing a screen in which it's, it's just the past. All of our grievances seem to take form. We have all these angry thoughts, these hate, spiteful, hateful thoughts in the mind, and what happens is they're in the picture show. And in a sense, it comes down real simply to the thoughts in our mind that we were saying there's just two thought systems and there's the fear-based ego thought and then there's the Holy Spirit thought and it comes down to first of all discernment between the two I need to be able to tell the difference between the two and then I, ha I need to start to let go or withdraw my uh, investment in the ego thought if I, if I think the ego is offering something that, to me that's good and useful and helpful I'm going to want it to stay around I'm going to hang on to it so to me, that's what the Course gets at. It starts getting at, well, how am I tapped into this thing, Jesus? And how am I invested in it, but I don't know it? You know? What, what's the value in it yeah. to me? I mean, it's like, what am I seeing here that I want to hang on to? Because it seems to be worthwhile. Yeah. So I'm not going to let go of something I feel like is worthwhile and gives me something. As my mind changes, then of course, I'm going to see proof for what the, for the new in my mind, I'm going to see proof for that out here on the screen. And so then I have uh, experiences come to me that witness to that, that new way of thinking in my mind. And so, you know, if, if I open up to the light and if I open up to the, the safety of trusting, then I'm going to have lots of experiences show up to prove to my mind that that's the case. And, if, and the reverse is true, too. You know, if I have lots of thoughts in my mind that it's not safe to trust, then, of course, what's going to show up is proof that I'm right about that, you know, and that it's not safe to trust. So the question is, what do I want? Yeah. It comes down to, what do I really want? And at the beginning, you know, when you first start working with this stuff, it's like, yuck, I must really want guilt and fear because I seem to to still be perceiving events that seem to witness to that. And so, of course, it's just kind of saying, you know, you really need to keep asking that question going deeper. I, I always tell the story, like, when I'm growing up, you know, before reports and everything, 
the two things that I wanted in life were freedom and intimacy. You know, I thought, ooh, that feeling of connectedness and intimacy, I want that. I just want that so much. And freedom, I like to score. I like to feel like there's nothing hanging over me, you know. And, and what I did was, it wasn't so much that my goals were wrong. You know, in the course, freedom and intimacy are, are, or peace are, are nice goals. But it's like it was where I was seeking for them that I started to discover was all twisted. And how you define them. And how I define them. Didn't I you think uh, that freedom and intimacy are juxtaposed? Those two particular... I, when the way I perceived it was kind of like when I would try to go for the intimacy, that my freedom seemed to be limited. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, that they didn't seem to be... Solitude and freedom, I don't, I don't think, yeah. juxtaposed, but it, intimacy and freedom... Intimacy. It seems so very much kind of like, I mean, in relationships, that was my experience. It's like, it's almost like I, you had to get the old ball and chain thing mutually about marriage. Mutually exclusive. Yeah, mutually exclusive. What I'm discovering through the course is not only they aren't mutually exclusive, but they're they're found in the identical same place. They're identical. My definition of freedom was I want to be able to go where I want to go, do what I want to do, do it how I want to do it, and do it when I want to do it, you know, kind of a real sense of not, you know, being any limitations or constraints. Now, would that mean that you would want to then find somebody who would want to do exactly <laughs> what you would want to do, when you want to do it, right? Well, if you that bring sounds in... sounds like a fantasy. That's right. If you bring in the intimacy part of it, you know, the intimacy part of it says, well, okay, I want the freedom, but I want that feeling of connectedness. I want the feeling of being so close to someone that's like we know each other's thoughts that I want that kind of closeness where there's no even sense of separation. And of course, I would say a lot of my intimacy ideas had a lot of romantic ideas, you know, tied in there too, you know, it wasn't, I had a lot of things associated with that too, with the body, you know, I, I want lots of things that I define intimacy. Companionship, you know, having somebody that's there with you, I mean, that has, that had a lot to do with my ideas of intimacy. It's not so easy, I would say, to be intimate if so she's living in California, and I'm living in New York, my ideas of intimacy were bodies must be together, you know, under the same roof preferably. As close as possible, as long as possible, you know, it would be the thing. And that, that was my definition, too, of intimacy. Now, the deeper I've gone into this and gone through relationships and all the different things and worked with the Course and, and had a lot of these transformations is that I find that, that both of my definitions really were very heavily related to the body. In other words, my definitions of freedom, when I said go anywhere, do anything, I'm talking a lot of it was mobility of the body. I want to be able to let this body move around. I want to be free to move. And so freedom was very tied in with freedom of the body. It wasn't so much freedom of the mind, I, I now see. And intimacy, you know, once again, I, I really related to intimacy with the bodies again. And it wasn't so much a mind intimacy that I defined it in terms of, of sharing thoughts, or sharing the Holy Spirit, but it was in terms of just get the bodies together, and you're lucky if you can agree on certain things and have mutual shared interests. What I found is that in relationship and true intimacy comes from following the Holy Spirit. And also, that's what true freedom is. But it flies against a lot of my ideas of what I thought you know, I had to do to become a fulfilled person. I, I found that I had to question an awful lot. Being used to, as we travel around the country and we go into things, that there's a real sense of intimacy you feel with people, a real connectedness, the thing that I always was searching for, but it's certainly not the form that I had envisioned for it.